Welcome once again to Dialogue on Public Issues. I'm John Chowning with Campbellsville University. We always try to bring people to the table for our interviews and visits uh, that would be of interest to our community and region. And I'm very pleased and honored today to be talking with uh, Mr. Russell Coleman, the United States Attorney for Kentucky's Western District. Mr. Coleman, welcome. Well, thank you for having me, Dr. Chowning. Uh, we appreciate you taking time uh, to be with us. Uh, congratulations on your appointment. And uh, share, share with us a little bit about uh, uh, how the appointment process works uh, to become a U U.S. attorney. Certainly, it's, it, it's easily the longest job interview I ever had. Okay. Uh, after the president won uh, election in 2016, I received a phone call asking if I would be interested in serving in this capacity as United States attorney. I was in private practice at the mm -hmm. time. A series of interviews uh, culminating in a sit down with Attorney General Sessions and Deputy Attorney General Rosenstein, mm -hmm. which is quite an interview process, uh, even before the nomination mm -hmm. to include an FBI background investigation and, and other interviews. I was nominated by President Trump on my wife's birthday. Okay. On, uh, and I'll never forget that date on <laughs> July 19th uh, uh, of 2017 mm -hmm. with the mandate of uh, making America safe again. Mm -hmm. And that, that was part of the press release that the White House sent out and is part of the mandate of what I do and what we do at the U.S. Attorney's Office. I then went through a second phase, and that is, mm -hmm. uh, uh, as your viewers will know, uh, presidential appointees are initially hired, uh, conditional by the president, but they mm -hmm. go through a process with the United States Senate, another interview process. And while I didn't have a formal hearing, uh, thankfully, uh, the committee took up my vote after uh, I had interviewed and mm -hmm. answered a number of questions voted out by the Senate Judiciary Committee and then ultimately confirmed unanimously, thankfully, by the United States Senate on September 22nd mm -hmm. of last year. So I'm, I'm going, uh, going on a year, approximately a year in this role. Now, our paths first crossed when you were serving as uh, attorney to Senator McConnell, is that correct? Uh, they did. I was legal counsel for a number of mm -hmm. years with, uh, with Senator McConnell. I, was, I went to law school to be an FBI agent. Okay. I, uh, I went to the University of Kentucky. and. Had, I'd wanted to be an agent since I was a kid, uh, growing up initially in Davis County, and I was blessed to have the opportunity to serve for a number of years as an FBI agent. I was injured, left the Bureau, mm -hmm. and uh, didn't know what I was going to do next. And I had never worked on Capitol Hill, other than mm -hmm. being an intern. I had never worked, certainly, in, in politics. As an agent, you stay far afield right. from, from right. such things. But I received a phone call, uh, again, I blessed to be provided an opportunity, ask if I wanted to serve as the leader's Council and did mm -hmm. that. Uh, it was if I had gone to anything else from having left the FBI, I don't think that would have been a. Mm -hmm. It would have been a challenging transition, uh, right. leaving my dream job. But I tell you, going to work for Senator McConnell for mm -hmm. what ended up being a five-year period right. of service, I wasn't able to spend a lot of time looking over my shoulder. It was mm -hmm. so intense. Right. And you and I crossed paths in your advocacy, both mm -hmm. for CU and and for this community, and we worked on a number of projects exactly. together. So. And, and then you went with a private law firm? I did. I practiced mm -hmm. law, a uh, private law firm, Frost Brown Todd, right. a, a large firm in, in Louisville. Mm -hmm. At the same time, I was a, a volunteer prosecutor, assistant commonwealth's attorney. I, I missed public service and jumped. I, I guess I failed at the private sector. <laughs> I, I, I jumped at the first opportunity to get back to law enforcement to serve in this capacity. Mm -hmm. Now, what is the approximate uh, geographic region? that you work in? So it's an important question because mm -hmm. it drives many of the challenges that I have, and we'll talk about this in mm -hmm. regard to the drug epidemic and right. some of the threats to this district. Backing up a bit, every state has at least one federal judicial district. In Kentucky, we have two. Larger states like California have four and five. We mm -hmm. have an eastern district and a western district. And I'm the U.S. Attorney for the West. Uh, the, the western district comprises 53 counties, okay. uh, just shy of two and a half million Kentuckians. Mm -hmm. The geographically it runs from Oldham County, suburban Louisville, down west, west of Paducah to our river counties there in Hickman and Fulton and Ballard mm -hmm. and Carlisle. So it is, it's a significant uh, geographic swath right. of Kentucky, two mm -hmm. time zones, multiple media markets. Uh, the, the U.S. Attorney has offices the, our, my primary office is in Louisville, mm -hmm. where most of my prosecutors and our colleagues sit. We have offices in Bowling Green and Owensboro and Paducah, everywhere where a, a federal court sits, we have an office. The only other staffed office, though, than Paducah, then, excuse me, Louisville, is in Paducah. And I've mm -hmm. recently increased the number of prosecutors we have down there. And just that geographic isolation of Paducah meant that we needed sure. to have actual prosecutors there. So you would have a career 
uh, attorneys working for you uh, and, and other staff that, that don't necessarily change. When, That's correct. When the, uh, that is correct. I'm the only political mm -hmm. appointee okay. in the office. Uh, mm -hmm. Everyone else, I, as I tell my colleagues, the prosecutors, I'm a temp. Mm -hmm. I serve at the mm -hmm. pleasure of the president. I, right. I have the opportunity to serve for a number of years. Most of the career prosecutors have been in the office for decades. Mm -hmm. I have colleagues that wear lapel pins that say 30 years of service to the United mm -hmm. States. So it, it's an interesting opportunity stepping into a role where you know you will be a temp, mm -hmm. but you have a sense of urgency in seeking to accomplish something during the time privileged to serve, but you're working with career staff that you know will be there long after you're gone. Mm -hmm. What are the duties? Uh, I, I, I have some idea, but perhaps our viewers don't necessarily know what a U.S. attorney does. At its base, the United States attorney is the chief federal law enforcement officer for a district. Mm -hmm. Uh, there is a significant coordinating role with the FBI, the DEA, all of the acronymed federal law enforcement agencies. But as Attorney General Sessions says often, 85% of law enforcement is done by our state and local colleagues. Mm -hmm. So I spend a lot of time engaging with our sheriffs, our chiefs, our post commanders from the Kentucky State Police. We have both, I have both a criminal role and a civil role. Mm. On the criminal side, we enforce violations of federal law, not state law, but violations of the United States Code. And we also defend the United States when there are lawsuits against mm -hmm. the VA or a federal agency. And we also do some civil enforcement on the healthcare fraud side. Okay. Of course, areas like Paducah, Louisville, Owensboro are centers of healthcare, Bowling mm -hmm. Green for the region. And so we work actively on the civil side to address healthcare fraud. Are, are drug related offenses uh, perhaps the most prevalent? Uh, uh, n numerically, uh, the biggest number of cases uh, typically in the average year? Both numerically and what keeps me up at night as mm -hmm. a dad mm -hmm. of young kids and as in this prosecutorial role are our drug threats. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they are a driver of so much of the criminality we see at the federal level, but also at the state level. And numerically, certainly, the vast number of our prosecutions have some nexus, some tie to drugs, either drug distribution mm -hmm. or there's criminality that's driven by drug addiction. And so, and I, I look forward to, to, to talking a bit more about just the, the threat that we face. Mm -hmm. When I, geographically, I mentioned when you ask, uh, I mentioned how important the geography is to the district. One of the counties of the 53, Jefferson is, mm -hmm. is unique. And I know as, as a Western Kentucky boy, I'm probably setting up a joke or two by some of your viewers. Mm -hmm. We know how unique Louisville mm -hmm. is. Right. It's unique in the sense that the opiate epidemic that is killing so many Kentuckians 1,565 right. last year, yeah. and I'm, I'm not a numbers guy. I went to law school to avoid math, but just to pause, 1,565 families, 1,565 churches and businesses lost a family member mm -hmm. last year to drug-related death, more than car crashes, more than any right. other cause of death for adult Kentuckians. In Jefferson County alone, 426 people died drug-related death last year. That's more than a, a person, a family day, losing someone. Right. So Louisville is unique in the sense that the opiate epidemic is very central to driving those drug deaths. We are underwater in Jefferson County with opioids, with fentanyl, with synthetic opioids, and with heroin. Blessedly, that, that opiate crisis really ends for the most part at the Jefferson County line. Mm -hmm. The other 52 counties I serve, in, including Taylor County, methamphetamines are the primary drug threat. Now, we still have opiates in, in the rest of the district. We lost eight Taylor Countyans last year mm -hmm. to drug-related death. I don't know the details of each of those, but uh, I, would, I would predict that those eight were tied, had a close nexus to opioids mm -hmm. and, and heroin. Right. Uh, we still have opioid deaths in the other districts, but, but the, the drug threat is very different. Meth here, uh, opioids in, in Jefferson County. Mm -hmm. Gone are the days, though, of seeing the University of Louisville burn unit filled with those that were burned due to home production of methamphetamine. Right. Uh, gone are the days that it was, it's produced at home for use or for sale. What we've seen over the last three or four years, and this is what keeps me up at night, Dr. Chowning, that the methamphetamine we see now, the meth, in, here in this county and in most of the district, comes straight from Mexico mm -hmm. and it's produced by cartels. Okay. It's produced, and, and the cartels are um, steely-eyed business people. I say that because our district has been flooded by high-quality, almost 100% pure methamphetamine mm -hmm. at a very low price, high quantities. 
So macroeconomics. Is that replacing heroin as the street drug of choice, so to speak? So it's it's not in the sense that uh, meth has been the primary drug mm -hmm. in, in all the counties but Jefferson County. It's a different type. I've had multiple conversations with sheriffs and with mm -hmm. chiefs trying to understand why the opioid crisis has not pervaded and invaded Western Kentucky. I get several answers, but the probably the consensus is that heroin just uh, didn't carve out the beachhead that methamphetamine did. Meth was originally produced at home using right. agricultural chemicals, you know, pseudoephedrine purchased at, uh, at, at drug stores, uh, anhydrous ammonia stolen from southern states and others. So, uh, anhydrous stolen from uh, large, uh, large agricultural related manufacturers. And so uh, meth was a problem in Western Kentucky. Opioids just, heroin did not rear its head here. Mm -hmm. It's a different type of high. Meth is a stimulant. Opioids are a depressant. And so blessedly that, that has stayed in Louisville. But the, the cartels have realized that if they dump in this large quantity of meth here in the Western District, kept the price low, not that it would drive out heroin, but mm -hmm. it would drive out the production at home. Okay. Because why would you take the risk of producing this at home, uh, the risk of being arrested when you're purchasing or stealing the chemicals, when you produce a product that's at low quantity, low quality, when you could buy it for pennies on the dollar from the cartels. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're facing. That, I, I serve a president that, that talks a lot about the Southwest border, right. an attorney general that talks a lot about the Southwest border. It's an important distinction in knowing that the methamphetamine we're seeing here, the heroin we're seeing here, the more dangerous synthetic drugs we're seeing here, they're not produced in Kentucky. They're not coming across the border from Indiana. They're produced in Mexico mm -hmm. in significant quantities and they're killing Kentuckians here. Mm. Now, in addition to obviously uh, combating crime and, 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 and getting uh, traffickers off the streets and, and, and trying to reduce the uh, overdoses and so forth, What's the economic impact? Or, or uh, there, there's a, another side to this, the work you're doing as well, beyond just uh, penalizing and bringing to bear the w weight of the law on those that particularly are pushing or trafficking. The gold standard for me as a prosecutor, the gold standard of law enforcement is deterrence. Mm -hmm. We certainly punish, and that right. is why we bring significant tools to bear terms of years in federal prison. We have some significant weapons that aren't available at the state, but we seek to deter, mm -hmm. ideally, and we punish when deterrence doesn't work. But there are uh, significant downstream impacts to the opioid crisis, to the meth crisis that we're contending with. Mm -hmm. One is workforce. Mm -hmm. One is the fact that employers are not able to find employees that can pass a drug test. Mm -hmm. So we, we don't talk enough about this. There are, there are a couple things that if I were to leave with, with points that are just exigencies in my mind, we don't talk enough about the impact of the drug crisis on economic development, mm -hmm. on point. filling jobs, but on the front end, we don't talk enough about prevention. Mm -hmm. I grew right. up in the 80s watching the, these commercials the, the, and it was very laudable and its goal, just say no. Right. Uh, Mrs. Reagan, uh, then First Lady, was a strong advocate for that campaign. There were commercials that all of your viewers will remember, uh, an egg cooking right. and a skillet, this is your brain on drugs. And I think the generation that grew up during that time frame mocked those commercials mm -hmm. a bit. You, the, the, they were a source of, of many jokes, well intended. But we're in an environment now where back then, it was attempting to, to keep kids off marijuana as a gateway to other drugs. We're in an environment now, and I, I emphasize this, where a single pill, mm -hmm. a single pill sampled at a party by one of our kids, the kids think they're taking something that came out of a medicine cabinet. The pill looks like something that came out of their, their mom or their grandmother's medicine cabinet. But that pill is a pressed synthetic opioid, something like fentanyl. Mm -hmm. Fentanyl is the driver of most of those numbers I mentioned earlier, right. the, the, the driver of those overdose deaths. 50 to 100 times stronger than heroin fentanyl is. And there are other synthetics that are even Carfentanil. stronger. Carfentanil. Carfentanil and yeah, elephant even, tranquilizer. Yeah, even more powerful than uh, That fentanyl. is a, a thousand times right. stronger than morphine. It's hard to imagine. An mm -hmm. elephant tranquilizer. One of those pills that resemble a known pharmaceutical substance can be fentanyl. Mm. One pill. First time a child ever samples a drug and they're dead from drug overdose. Mm. This isn't just a, a hand-wringing federal right. prosecutor. Right. This is a dad that worries constantly about the world that my kids are going to grow up in. And so we have to, one, as parents, as educators, as, as community leaders, 
we have to do a better job talking about prevention mm -hmm. because the margin of error does not exist. And it does not exist with our kids. We also have to do a better job of talking about this downstream economic impact of the mm -hmm. drug crisis. The, the drug epidemic is a Gordian knot. One of those strands of the knot is clearly enforcement. Mm -hmm. That my colleagues and I need to do a better job of making these substances harder to find, right. thus raising the price. We also need to do a better job of collaborating because the other strands of that Gordian knot are prevention and treatment, the healthcare sector, the education sector. One of our greatest limiting factors in law enforcement, and I'll say this as a former FBI agent, is what it says on our badge. We have not traditionally done a good job in law enforcement. The sheriff's department, working with the police department, mm -hmm. working with the state police, we, we've not been as collaborative as we should have been. That's changing mm -hmm. because the nature of the crisis is so significant that we can't go at it alone. Not only do we have to do a better job collaborating across the badge, and you're seeing great examples of this here in Taylor County I want to get to in a moment, but we have to now collaborate with the healthcare sector, mm -hmm. with the education sector, with the business community, and it's, it, the, the threat is so significant that it's driving that collaboration. We have to do a better job, again, prevention, mm -hmm. talking about prevention, and talking about that economic impact. T tell us about collaborating here in Taylor County as an example of how that interagency and interlocal, local, state, federal. Yeah. And, I, and related to that, when does it become a federal issue? Well, we want to be better partners mm -hmm. at the end of the day. The United States Attorney's Office, federal law enforcement wants to be better partners. We have internal thresholds that we look at, drug quantity, mm -hmm. the, the amount of fraud when, when someone is victimized that are on paper. But if, if a prosecutor, and I have this conversation with Commonwealth attorneys all the time, with county attorneys, if the state system has someone that they are having a difficult time dealing with, no matter the quantity of drugs, we'll take a look at it at the federal system mm -hmm. because we have mandatory minimums and mm -hmm. tools to take that problem individual out of the community. We don't handle volume, an enormous volume of cases at the federal right. level. Our role is to take out the worst of the worst. Right. Our role is to take out the trigger puller, the significant drug trafficker, the fraudster that's going after our parents or grandparents mm -hmm. using the internet as a means to gain access to them. So we'll take a look at any matter that a, a prosecutor or our colleagues bring to us and then evaluate it based upon federal law. So our door is open and we're open for business. You asked me about collaboration here mm -hmm. in Taylor County. Taylor County is a member of, and I'm, I'm a Fed, so I'll not leave here without a couple of acronyms. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. mandatory. Right. HIDA is the High Intensity Drug Trafficking mm -hmm. Area, or, or HIDA. It's one of those acronyms that matters. Right. It matters because what HIDA does is bring federal resources to local and state law enforcement, allow them to use the resources to, the, to prioritize the issues in that community. Taylor County is blessed to be part of the Columbia HIDA Drug Task Force, Taylor County, Adair County, Marion County. And so you have federal, state, and locals, mm -hmm. uh, ATF, uh, DEA, the state police, your sheriff's departments, your municipal departments, all collaborating, working together across county lines. I was at the Creekside restaurant uh, a few months ago, mm -hmm. sitting down with members of that task force, Good. doing a lot more listening than I was talking. And although I'm talking a lot here, when I'm meeting with law enforcement out in the state, I do a lot more listening, and sure. I encourage my colleagues, my other prosecutors, to do mm -hmm. a lot more listening. And they were laying out some of their challenges, some of the cases, some of the drug distribution networks that they just hadn't been able to tackle. Well, subsequent to that, we went back to my office in Louisville, and prosecutors responded. We indicted 14 individuals uh, of a drug, related to a drug trafficking organization, mm -hmm. primarily in Marion County, but also here in Taylor County a few months ago. I had two different officers come up to me at a recent officers conference in Louisville and say, and I'm not gonna mention the specific county, Please. but an adjacent certainly, county, certainly. came up to me and said, our confidential informants are having a tough time finding narcotics in X community. They can't find the drugs because you dried them up. Now, I don't know how long that will be right. because these, these business organizations evolve. They're Darwinian. They, they, they want to make that money. They don't matter who they, they hurt in bringing that poison in. I don't know if we have eliminated drugs in that particular community for two months, three months, four months. But for that period of time, because of the degree of collaboration, mm -hmm. there's a kid that's not going to get access right. to narcotics. There's an addict <clears throat> that is not going to get access mm -hmm. to narcotics, and maybe we can reach them with treatment. And so that's, that's our mission, to, to sit down and listen and determine what are the priorities in Taylor County and Logan County and McCracken and Warren out in the district. Because mm -hmm. one of our failings, I think, from the federal system 
is the further you get from the Golden Triangle, and I have colleagues uh, in the Eastern District in Lexington, we, we have this same conversation. The further you get from Lexington and Louisville, the less services you are rendered right. by your government. Right. The further you go in the purchase and the penny row, you want to know where the feds are. What are your tax dollars doing? And we're working to get away from Jefferson County, to spend time out in the counties, to have an impact, to mm -hmm. be relevant. Not to replace the Commonwealth's attorneys, but to be better partners. And collaboration is the name of the game because the threat, as we're discussing here, the threat's just too large not to. Mm -hmm. Do, do you deal with uh, terrorism cases from time to time? And I would ask you in a general sense, has that uh, decreased? Is it increasing? Uh, comment on that. It's, it's a good question. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a good question sitting here in Kentucky, how, how much do we prioritize right. threats from terrorism? We must remain vigilant. Mm -hmm. We're of course here in Western Kentucky, we're not the target, the high profile target as we would be if we were in Washington DC sure. or New York or on the West Coast. But again, we must remain vigilant. In 2011, my predecessor as U.S. Attorney working with the FBI indicted two Iraqi refugees who, and, and ultimately convicted them of material support for terrorism. These are two individuals who we brought in from Iraq to provide shelter that used the refugee program to gain access to this country that were then plotting in Bowling Green on how they could kill U.S. troops serving in Iraq, mm -hmm. attempting to buy stingers and other high-impact weaponry to kill our, our soldiers, our troops, in Bowling Green, Kentucky. Mm -hmm. We're also, we're at a time where the internet has a long reach. Uh, reaching Syria or the source of some of this terror is a click away. So one of the challenges that law enforcement faces is identifying what is known as the homegrown, mm -hmm. violent extremist. Someone that may not have traveled to Iraq, may not have traveled to Syria, but because of these horrendous videos online, because of access to some of the, the instigators overseas and ISIS and Al-Qaeda are looking for an opportunity to attack us here, sitting in a basement somewhere in Western Kentucky. We must remain vigilant. So I, I re regularly, I'm briefed on terrorism investigations we have in this district. Go ahead. No, please. I, I would presume that uh, you monitor or the other federal and state agencies monitor certain domestic groups as well that may or may not be the, the source of a actions and, that is and, true. and hate uh, directed towards certain groups and individuals. We, we've seen in the media mm -hmm. has, has spent a lot of time on this recently, an uptick uh, nationally mm -hmm. on uh, right-wing extremists. Mm -hmm. We, we want to be very cautious that we don't violate the First Amendment rights of groups. Mm -hmm. We don't investigate groups because of their views. Right. We investigate groups because of their views coupled with criminal behavior. Exactly. So we want to be very, very careful. Right. Right. But I'm, I'm regularly briefed on both domestic investigations and international mm -hmm. investigations. Uh, the director of the FBI, Chris Ray, has said recently publicly that the FBI has terrorism investigations in every state and every district of the United States. So I'm not breaking news here by advising right. that we have, we have folks that we're, again, attempting to remain vigilant and protecting the folks in Western Kentucky. Mm -hmm. uh, you are involved in civil rights cases, is that correct? We are. The, uh, mm -hmm. the Department of Justice works cases both from the U.S. Attorney's Office mm -hmm. as well as uh, lawyers in Washington, D.C. support those investigations. If your viewers, I'm, I'm very, very proud of the history of the Department of Justice mm -hmm. enforcing our civil rights laws. Right. Recently, we successfully convicted a police officer, and I say this with, uh, with great sadness, convicted a police officer, Providence, Kentucky police officer, of violating the civil rights of another Kentuckian. Mm -hmm. we, we are very, attempting again to remain vigilant on civil rights violations. If, if your viewer has, have not, viewers haven't read the, the recent biography on Grant by, uh, by Mr. Chernow, who also wrote on Hamilton, there's a significant portion of that book that deals with Reconstruction. Mm -hmm. The Department of Justice didn't exist until 1871. The purpose of the department in its creation in 1871 was to protect African Americans in the mm -hmm. South who had been treated as chattel, right. allow them to become citizens, not only to vote, but become legislators and leaders. The Department of Justice, some of my predecessors, Benjamin Bristow, who went on to found the American Bar Association, was a solicitor of the General of the United States, a Kentuckian, was U.S. attorney for a period of time, helped lead that charge, uh, protecting African Americans mm -hmm. in the South for President Grant. We've carried that forward to recent cases, prosecutions here. We're, that, that is something that will always remain a priority for the Department of Justice. Uh, a growing area, I'm sure, that consumes the time of your, you and your uh, colleagues is cyber crimes. 
it, it is, and it, it's why a moment ago you and I discussed mm -hmm. some of the cyber programs, mm -hmm. training programs right. here at Campbellsville University. Mm -hmm. It's critically important that we have trained staff, critically important we have agents and staffers trained in the cyber arts because that is a, that is a growing threat, not only in intrusions mm -hmm. uh, as, as we see those, those high profile prosecutions, but as I say when I speak to groups, particularly kids, I pull out my cell phone and, and say this is one of the most dangerous items in your home because that cell phone is an entree to everyone's home and an entree point to our children mm -hmm. and our grandchildren. And there are predators out there that use that technology. As much as it's wonderful technology and it's, it's, it's fueling innovation and, and uh, there are employers like Amazon right. here in, in Taylor County that are, are utilizing that to create opportunity. Predators use that to gain access to kids. And that phone, that mini computer, portable computer, is present in any criminal violation now. So whether it's uh, drug trafficking, whether it's a, uh, a violent offense, whether it's an attempt to gain access to our kids or a, a uh, more traditional cyber intrusion, mm -hmm. that is that phone, our ability to use those cyber techniques are critically important. Training people to help us in that effort is also critically mm -hmm. important. We're out of time. Well, it's been a real pleasure. Russell Coleman, U.S. District Attorney for Kentucky's Western District, our guest, and we wish you the very best and Godspeed in all that you do. Well, thank you, sir. And thanks for being here. This is John Chowning with Dialogue on Public Issues. Thank you. Mm -hmm.